to the English translation stream for genome editing with CRISPR and Cas. A new hope or attack of the clones? That's the question today. You probably heard about the uh, research information about a Chinese man called He who edited something with the babies. We'll hear more about this later. The main tool that was used in that research, or what is proposed to be research, is a tool called CRISPR, which is the scissors, and a, another tool called CAS, which is kind of a gluey thing. This talk is both uh, an introduction and an outlook re, uh, respective to the how this is going to affect us, what are the dangers, what are the benefits of this research. Please welcome the speakers. Hi, this is Katrin, this is Anna, I'm Andre. We want to talk about genome editing using CRISPR and CAS. Will this be a new hope or attack of the clones? What scissors? What? There was a lot of things in the uh, international press. One is planned, so a genetically edited one being over design, the final taboo in gene tag, up to 290% of revenue using CRISPR theoretics. This is how it's going to continue. The battle about the gene scissors is just starting. And it's talking about patent attorneys, the bad guys. Exactly how this works is something that Anna will tell us about. I will give you a very short introduction to, into DNA. DNA, the code inside our cells and that we use to survive. DNA is being translated or transported via RNA. Always three bases are coding for one amino acid. So if I change a base, if I change a base the amino, uh, amino acid will change. And proteins are made out of many, many amino acids. And most, chain, uh, most things happening inside a cell are based upon proteins acting. And the diagram in the bottom right is, the, is a codon diagram to tell you how with just four bases we can encode 20 different amino acids. So all the three bases make up one, uh, encode one amino acid and the language has four different ones to choose from. And what exactly is CRISPR now? CRISPR is part of the bacterial immune system, if you want to call it that. Uh, the authors are the ones that have the patent currently. The images of the Ocola bacterium typically found in human intestines. And these bacteria can themselves also be infected by viruses and become ill. So the virus attacks and uh, dumps its own uh, uh, genes inside, and this infects the, the, the bacteria, which in turn produces more viruses. And this ultimately kills the bacterium and produces a lot of viruses, which in turn can infect further bacterial cells. So what's now the use for CRISPR? Uh, when the phage uh, attacks, the uh, RNA will bro break apart and CRISPR will uh, glue the code into the, the original bacteria code. 
This allows a second enzyme to later de detect and destroy the uh, bacterial RNA. This in turn uh, allows the E. coli bacteria to be safe from the attacking virus. CRISPR-Cas uh, Cas only cuts uh, at a, a triplet called NGG. And this triplet is very prevalent everywhere in the genome. So it could, in theory, cut everywhere. So there's another 20 uh, bases to uh, de and allow a detection sequence to allow for specific cutting. So application, this is an animal cell. We have prepared the DNA with a cast sequence, which turn, means the DNA is split apart. And we now use the repair mechanisms of the cell because uh, DNA breaking is very common in a cell. This breaking is being detected and then fixed either perfectly using kind of a glue or additional bases may be introduced. So that would be an insertion and an indel would be something that, that gives an offset of a different value than three bases, which means the entire readout is now changed. Of course, it can also be that but more bases are deleted, so this would be equally destroying the way it's being read. So the entire gene is being destroyed because it can no longer function to encode for the same protein. So how is this used inside a laboratory? We want to force cells to produce something they would not originally do or we want to make them produce something they already produce in a different way, or we want to uh, change structural parts within the DNA, so not encoding for proteins, but something else. So either introducing new sequ sequences or by moving the uh, way it's being read out, so the, the, the code on structure. So uh, b basic research means we change something, we look what happens. Ah, no, no. Uh, Before we get to uh, more concrete information about how it's applied, we want to make some comparisons to technology. So Cas9 in the bacterial immune system is basically a virus scanner using gRNA as a signature. There's, uh, there's also a comparison uh, with a text editor or word, or of course the gene scissors. The connotation is th this is precise and it's correct technically, but this is a biochemical system and not a binary system, so it's not always that easy. Because, for example, DNA and RNA molecules that don't fit 100%, but almost, can adhere. So the Cas9 may cut in places that weren't targeted. So uh, a good comparison is this sort of broken regex, which would cause off-target effects and so, uh, thus side effects. And uh, side effects have associated risks. So back to Anna. But people have thought about how to minimize these off-target effects. Cas9 has a certain error tolerance, but uh, you can use bio tools of bioinformatics to find uh, sequ sequences that are as unique as possible. Or you can use Cas9 NICAS, which needs two guide RNAs. So your sequence size is now 40 bases, and you have a much lower probability of off-target effects. 
Then there are different Cas proteins that are, have a different specificity when cutting. And of course, anti-CRISPR proteins, which deactivate CRISPR. That's the basics, more or less. Uh, CRISPR makes uh, basic research a lot faster and a lot more precise. But now CRISPR in medicine. And the, the big question is, can we cure genetic diseases? Theoretically, yes. If the disease is monogenetic, meaning it's only caused by one gene, if it's often the same mutation causing it, because then you can just reuse a system you already established, gene doping doesn't work because it, the effects usually involve many genes, with, uh, so it's very difficult to handle. And it's not really practicable. The question is, how do we get CRISPR-Cas into the cell? For example, we can extract uh, stem cells, uh, treat them externally, and put them back in. But of course, you can use a virus as a vector, but that's one of the greater difficulties. There are studies, about 20 of them, One thing is creation of CAR T cells against cancer. Those are immune cells that are extracted from the patient, rewritten and put back in. They do it already, but uh, you could also do the modification with CRISPR, which would be much faster and cheaper, and also better. Then there's beta thalassemia, or HPV, and uh, like an HPV cutting out viral sequences. Then there's this one about phenylketonuria, which seems to have been cured. The thing is, if you read a bit more, it has been done in a mouse model. And uh, the disease involves a gene being broken. The thing is, there are more than 850 possible uh, mutations causing the actual illness. So now they've fixed one, but there may be more. Hmm? Well, this is interesting, and researchers should be more clear in communicating which model they used. So now the really interesting part, mm, editing inherited DNA directly. Mm, like in an embryo, sperm, an ovum. In that case, the change you induce via CRISPR will be in almost all cells of the resulting being, including all germline cells. So it would be persistent. The potential is you could genetically fix inheritable diseases. And the human in question would be born healthy. The success quota in embryo tests is right now around 70%. So now the question, before we get to the ethics of it, is it useful? Because we have every gene doubled, except... Hmm? So if we uh, pass it on, we pass on one of both, the other partner transmits another one, so there may be embryos that are naturally healthy, even though both parents are ill. Mm -hmm. Something that might be less controversial is the uh, selection of embryos through prenatal screening. You don't do anything different with CRISPR. Mm -hmm. You have to sort through the edited ones and junk those where the edit didn't work properly. There are ethical properties, uh, throwing away the failed ones, and with CRISPR, you have off-target effects and lack of consent of the treated individual. So almost the whole world um, has uh, passed a moratorium on the thing. 
and the UNESCO is trying to establish a global standard. Uh, there were, are some biohackers who put a lot of hope in CRISPR and <laughs> the best thing that can happen is nothing, a failure. M or you can get an allergic reaction or some other crap can happen. So I would uh, apply the standards of another com community, be safe, be sane, and be consensual. So, a short uh, summary. For some diseases, it may work or it would work. For embryos, it's not really needed. And with biohacking, it raises all sorts of ethics questions. Now that we are talking about ethics, MIT Technology Review had this exclusive Chinese thing. A Chinese scientist um, created the first CRISPR babies. What the fuck did he do? He, that's Dr. Yang Kui He. You can see on the right. He apparently um, had the first CRISPR babies, Lulu and Nana, that's not the real names. So the scientific discussed, scientifically discussed names. He did one gene change in the gene CCR5, which he deactivated, which is therefore the same uh, the receptor of the same name. And that receptor uses the HI virus to infect the cell. It uses the CCR5 to inject its information into the cell and make an infection. His process was like amateurish. It's not what I'm saying, but a lot of colleagues saying. He hasn't published anything. But in the end of November, on a conference, when he had a speech, there was this interesting Twitter thread by a scientist where other scientists um, also jumped in. They commented every single uh, slide commented what about this is kind of questionable and they um, had the result it's amateurish and there were problems with consent we don't really know if the parents so the man was was apparently HIV positive and they requested for the study and we don't really know if they knew that they are registering for a new method that was like used for the first time, but there were more, more problems. It was all a bit weird, and the experiments were secret. But but he apparently did, had planned a PR campaign. I would say mm, that's a bit fishy. There's even more. That's a great summary where we'll show a link. But the most fascinating thing I found was um, deleting CCR5 does not mean you are immune against HIV. What you're doing if you um, turn off CCR5 is you take away one possible gate for um, the HIV virus to infect a cell. And many changes and deactivations will mean that you are much more success susceptible to other illnesses. And there are um, a drugs you can tell that uh, take that actually do the same thing that he did with CRISPR-Cas. And there are a lot of methods for insemination that make sure that embryos are not HIV positive. So this is like shooting with at sparrows with cannons you can ask why because there are so many other ways to do it if you want to learn more there's a great article by Ed Young in the Atlantic he uh, deconstructed that and there's the Twitter thread linked there 
You can find it in the slides we'll publish there. Shortly, we, we, we had the first CRISPR baby. The goal is really weird. And the way is at least interesting. Kathleen. Yeah. That was a bit harsh. Let's go to genetics in um, farming. The hope here is that CRISPR-Cas will help us come up with uh, coming up better better plant species in a cheaper way. The way that is more ideal allows for better plants. So the entire uh, value stream will be thus. So the, the, the main idea is we hope for a new mutation that will improve a useful feature e either in a farm animal or in a plant. Doesn't have to be a monogenetic uh, feature, but we, we hope to improve something. V typically very diffuse and con convoluted co correlation. In basic research, we're uh, discovering more and understanding more in how the uh, how the plant's uh, resource processing works. And there will also be a talk on this on this topic, information biology. This talk will likely go into much more depth on this uh, area. A second path is the genome sequencing that is also apparently uh, following the Moore's law. So it gets faster, it gets cheaper, it gets better. Of course, this is a lot of data, which means we need to do, use uh, big data methods to go through them and use them for something useful. And for this, we need a lot of computation power. But in the end, we hope to uh, yield a process uh, allowing us to, to find out which gene change causes what effect. So the end goal is, is having a candy store like where we can just select what we want to do and we know exactly what, what change we need to do to get that. We've been uh, doing a similar process in the classic uh, classic plant size where we uh, selected and then uh, recombinated to 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 get uh, to to move improve the wild uh, species out there into uh, specially raised plant types in in wild uh, Wild species, we still find a lot of adaptations to uh, th threats to uh, different aroma types. So something we all know is that farm-grown tomatoes just don't taste like original tomatoes or wild tomatoes. Using all of the information we have gathered in, in, in basic science, we can now think about it similar to how computer science works. So we can try to features to at, at, at random or however we want and mix and match them to arrive at ideal types. But of course, what exactly does ideal mean? Uh, we want... So we, we like it to be tasty, we like it to be healthy, want it to grow fast, stores well. As, as a society, we should think about the climate change We should think about resilience against threats, like new pathogens or... Concrete example, recently published, using the wild and cherry tomato. So wild tomatoes are about pea size, with only few, about four in this example, 
of deliberate changes, it was possible to increase the size greatly uh, to about cherry tomato size. This can be quantized. Uh, the fruit weight tripled roughly. And also many more blossoms, meaning many more fruits on the same plant. And sometimes this is also uh, very important economically. Uh, one example is that seed seeds currently is kind of like a, re re a recurring cost because you, you, you don't have to just buy it once, you have to re uh, buy it every year. Uh, one example, uh, this is rice and it's it should be uh, seeded using the wind. And, and normally you sh should be able to, to take part of the uh, good yield and, and regrow that. And uh, recently edited rice actually allows this to, to, to do that because classically, classic uh, gene edited rice does not allow reseeding. And this, this allows uh, the greatly in, in increased yield to stay over many generations. While well, considering all of these interesting options, we of course also have to look at the uh, legislative uh, rulings there. So for this we need to look uh, in, into the past for a couple of decades. So we need to look at classic uh, gene transfer technology. So m moving genes from one plant to a different one, or from one species to, to a different one. There are of course uh, it rules that, that, uh, allow, uh, that means it, it's not a GMO, it's not genetically modified, so it's mutagenesis. So by uh, in, in inducing a lot of change and then selecting for interesting change, this is not a GMO. And in many ways, gene editing is much more like a mutagenesis and not like a classic GMO. The EU uh, Court of uh, Justice ruled that uh, gene editing is not part of the classic mutagenesis. So it's not uh, part of the selected off. But it should be, in, in, in fact, be, be categorized as the same as a GMO. Because it's both, uh, because we don't know it yet know about uh, side effects. But we already know it, it's, it will be much uh, faster and easier to, to employ these tools. So we ne you need to use the precautionary principle. So we might uh, collect our findings so far, maybe a bit uh, resigned. It's very possible to uh, improve uh, current species with useful muta uh, mutations. But, but we need to fi find rules and figure out exactly how we're going to, to treat all that and how we're going to uh, put that into regulation. But of course the big companies using GMO right now have the required attorneys to, to, to do that. Okay. Finally. How does CRISPR-Cas work? It's fast precise and cheap, just like Rogue One. We use CAS to mark a place to cut, and if we deliver a repair template along with it, we're basically done. We have seen that it makes basic research a lot easier. Easier. We can collect a lot, no, a lot of more knowledge, how biology works, how diseases work, and just a lot of the basics. We can cure some diseases, some. Uh, 
you probably don't even have to work in the germline because there are other methods. CRISPR babies? I illustrated that with Jar Jar Bings because it's reality and you don't really know why. Thank you. We can breed organisms very directionally and many people could do that because mutagenesis would happen in the same plant so we would not have to transfer it. The problem is the legal situation is interesting. It's similar to uh, copyright filters. It's gonna hurt the little ones, of course, and bigger ones. I'm not gonna name any names, huh? We'll have no problems. They're just gonna smile and scratch themselves on the butt thinking about their well-financed legal division. So, what can it do? Well, first, it can accelerate research both in uh, basic research, like uh, the function of biology, biological systems, diseases, but also in applied science, we can see what works under certain conditions, or worse. It just is faster with CRISPR-Cas. There have been f uh, a few initial clinical studies about uh, therapies. With food plants, it works very, very well in the lab. It seems that embryos have been edited. What can it not do? It can't heal anything that isn't genetic. If the initial cause is not hidden somewhere in the genome, then, well, CRISPR-Cas is just CRISPR-Cas. It can't heal all genetic diseases. And it can't enhance things like size, intellect, gene doping, CRISPR-Cas is a tool, a powerful tool, but a tool. And the difference is in how we use it. And so what questions are caused by all of this? What ethic do we ethics do we follow? With the whole CRISPR-Cas discussion, uh, certain ethical questions that we had put uh, on the back burner had caught up with us. They're getting more pressing because CRISPR-Cas is so fast, precise, cheap, and so on. It starts with the discussion we had with Anna with the embryos, but it basically hits all areas we had. This discussion should have been had in many of these places already. Fear of the unknown, you know, the reaction when we mentioned uh, agriculture, green genetic editing technology, uh, not everybody on the street is a fan. I'm not saying this is out of lack of knowledge, but we have a method that can do so many things that science communication, so science itself, has to explain a lot more so people don't get scared of the unknown. But I think uh, we have to work with the unknown a bit more to make it more known. Acceptance through passivity. Maybe the one thing or the other passes us by and just sort of happens and we don't really realize it. It's an open question. Will this happen, maybe? Because CRISPR-Cas is used in so many areas. Who should decide something like this? And uh, this is me saying it. I'm a scientist. Oh dear God, don't just let scientists decide that. And uh, 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 that's about it with the Academy of Science. I guess I'm done. But that's how it is. Uh, society should decide that. A mix of different groups of people. No? Uh, it's difficult. How fast does the law react to science? We have this uh, uh, European court ruling where we went towards uh, better safe than sorry. Interesting story. But this may not work as well with patents and monopolies by large companies. It's a thing you have to deal with, dear politics. 
atomic gardening is okay, so throw a radioactive source into the environment and see what happens, but targeted mutagenesis isn't. I, I, I want to see this discussed, P put both next to each other and compare them. I can see the ethical problem, even on the technical side, but how do we want to talk about it? CRISPR has a potential for democratization and decentralization. How can we use this? Why do we deign to afford locked up science, a great talk to this morning, with topics like this? Science behind a paywall that isn't accessible to everyone. When we have things as important as this, can we as a society even discuss this still? We thought long and hard if you put a lot of answers at the end of a talk. We would love to give you more answers, but we have these questions too. Some of them deal with science, some of them are relevant to all of us. And uh, we can't give you a lot of answers, except explain to you how CRISPR-Cas works in different areas and applications. We, I think we've done it at least sort of property. Thanks for listening. CRISPR-Cas is a tool and we have to talk about what we do with it. This was Anna and Catherine. My name was Anna and thank you for listening. Okay. So. Uh, thanks André, Katrin and Anna. There's still a few minutes for Q&A few questions at the microphones. Get there fast, we don't have th that much time. But we can do one or two questions. Microphone three. I did not understand yet why CRISPR-Cas can't uh, cause a betterment of a human, enhancement of humans. I mean, if I put a gene for a uh, growth hormone into an embryo, he could get bigger. Uh, yes, you could do this, but the problem is you have to look at how the human feels about it. And humans have pretty long generational um, phases, and if you discuss it without ethics, you throw in a gene, you don't really know what happens if you have it double. Maybe it will be a bit stronger. So you have to look what happens with this type. It's three centimeters bigger or 20, but there are these problems with it. Not every protein only does this one thing. They are always connected with other proteins, other hormones, which do other things. And you can't just put something in twice and the double the thing will happen. That's not how humans work. Okay, microphone number four. Yeah, sorry. I don't see you that way. Well, my question is... People often say, this will be cheap. How can I understand this? Can I do this at home? Can I play with genes? Or is that a big laboratory with 50, 60 people? 50, 60 people you don't need, like five, a team maybe. Dollar amounts, I don't really know. But it's like, you can get this RNA in the internet, get it in a week for two to three euro, the sequence. So yeah, this is like what a uni work group with a professor could do. Or like in China, one doctor with, I don't know, a few nurses and maybe one, two other doctors, approximately. And before it would be 50 to 60 people, which is a whole amount more. Microphone one. Uh, how can I can I look uh, at an or organism and see um, where it works? You you can look at viruses that attack cells. In this one paper, we had viruses th that attacked a liver. Um, how targeted it was, I can't really say. You can take a virus or you filter the cells, like blood cells, and um, 
at it, they, them, like to say this, we we did not did not make the liver sick in the virus. There was a CRISPR cas, and we knew that the virus only targets the liver. Number two, thanks for the talk, for the cool talk. I saw there are do-it-yourself kits for order at home and I was asking myself what can I do with that? Can we, should we fear that this will be a problem? I mean it will be very cheap. I think one of these biohackers uh, has this and they are not really approved by the FDA so that wasn't the question. Yeah, theoretically, I don't know what is in these kits specifically, but if I go into the laboratory with my old CRISPR stuff, I can like do a lot of what I worked on. I could try it, but I would need... I can't really go into a bacterium with my stuff, but I could do stuff at home, theoretically. To be more precise, it depends on if we think really villainously, like in a comic book, I want to make a death bacterium. That's not that easy. If you just have the idea and you just cut around at three easy pieces, this bacterium will can just die in the environment. This is it's not as easy that the question again wasn't quite clear I could be lucky I could just do some stupid stuff unqualified stuff and put it out into the environment is that realistic or is it not it's pretty unrealistic luckily the chance with randomness is like 2 billion to zero that area. Luckily, building a super bacteria, I feel it's like that area. You would have to know which genes to put in. So you would have to do a lot of bacteria science, which will take a few years. And after that problem is you could make very virulent bacteria but they get killed fast so your super bacteria might be very locally uh, limited but randomly creating stuff is very hard that would be a thing that nature would do to, to for us randomly uh, thanks for this final sentence and uh, the big applause to the three.